Hello and welcome to the Inner Sense channel. Is there a way to talk about how we perceive the world, act in the world and make sense of the world that also explains how other organisms, communities and systems operate, right from ant colonies to teams of work colleagues? Today we have Daniel Friedman helping us understand a conceptual framework called Active Inference, which may be able to do just that. Daniel has a fascinating academic background in biology and genetics. His PhD was studying ant behaviour. He co-founded the Active Inference Lab. I really hope you enjoy this conversation and can see how sensing inner bodily sensations or interoception fits with this active inference framework. Please remember to subscribe to the Inner Sense channel for more information about the role of your bodily sensations and tips for using bodily awareness to improve your well-being. Thank you. Okay, so good morning, Daniel. I believe it's pretty early on in your homeland. Yes, yes, it's, it is early in California. 6 a.m. or 7 yes. a.m. Okay, Six. so thanks ever so much for taking the time to, or making the time so early on to join us on the Inner Sense channel. Um, we're here today to talk about a topic called active inference. So please, could you tell me a little bit about your background and how you ended up establishing the Active Inference Lab, which is something that I've really enjoyed um, viewing. It's an online participatory lab that's communicating learning and practicing applied active inference. Well, thanks for the invitation. And yes, looking forward to unpacking a lot of this. And I'll just begin with my path and how we all together came to working in this active inference lab. So I've been a student of biology and genetics, always very curious about how different living systems worked and enacted in their environments. And I went to graduate school, did a PhD in biology, and specifically that was in behavioral ecology in ants. And so for five years in graduate school, I did field work in Southern Arizona in the United States, and also a lot of lab work and computational work. And all of those experiences are kind of embodied in their own way and help just show me some glimmers of how many different methods and approaches and perspectives there were on just one question, like how do ants make decisions about how to regulate their foraging behavior at the colony level? So that's kind of what I've been interested in from a research perspective. And during that time, I was also learning more about different frameworks for perception, cognition, and action. And There are many such frameworks, but the one that I started to learn more about in around 2017 and 2018 was the free energy principle and active inference. So, Mm -hmm. comma there. I'll just leave leave there before we go to the next (laughs) chapter. Yes. Wow. So, uh, I'm I'm just curious about ants and um, how you study them in the field. So, literally, you were out, but these weren't ants that had been collected in a kind of glass container these were in a literal field were they yes they were in an actual open grassy field and ant field work was awesome the methods ranged from highly improvised and basic like using toothpicks and spray bottles of water and stopwatches and little flags and a lot of just things that are available objects and questions that people could ask in their local neighborhood or in their backyard, counting ants crossing one direction or another on the trail. But then also there was the liquid nitrogen and collecting ants and labeling them and giving them pharmacological treatments and then collecting them and measuring different aspects of their gene expression and all that comes with that in terms of like the molecular biology and the computation. So ants are awesome to study and I hope that we can continue to tie that in in this conversation because Mm -hmm. although your wall and some of your previous discussions focus on the humant 
<laughs> sometimes I just think about things in terms of the ants and the colony. And um, I think that just shows how when we do have integrative ways to talk about perception, cognition, and action, everybody will have their own systems that they've studied and phenomena that they've looked into, but there will also be like a, a higher language that helps us connect the dots across those different systems. Okay. Yeah. And I think uh, that word language, as you just said, is um, sometimes it's uh, key. I, I think you had, um, was it Mark Solms on your channel a while back? And he um, said this phrase, I think it was a uh, avoid, he was wanting to avoid getting into semantic tangles. And I think that is so, such a, you know, I love that, that phrase has stayed with me and it's so, um, such a useful thing to remember when trying to have these sorts of discussions that, as you said, we can be coming from different perspectives and have different experiences and different languages to describe what we think is a useful way to explain our existence. Um, but one person's choice of words might have a very different semantic uh, reasoning or understanding to someone else's. So, um, Yes, let's proceed. Um, one other thing I wanted to, to mention now, the, the theme tune for the Active in Inference Lab is excellent. Was there any particular reason why you chose that theme tune? Was it, did it represent the free energy principle or active inference? Or <laughs> it's got some stochastic elements and some non-stochastic elements. The theme song was a special request of a friend of one of the co-founders of the lab, Ivan. And uh, Dima Shvakov is the name of the musician. And at least I did not provide even any suggestions. But when I hear it, I hear how there's a, a, a regimentation mm -hmm. and an orderliness, but also uh, an energetic feeling and a motivational and maybe even an action oriented feeling to it. So it always is exciting when I hear it. Um, let me return to the story of the lab. So in uh, 2019, I connected with the other people who we would all together go on to co-found the lab, and that was Alex and Yvonne. And we were very interested in applying active inference to organizational design, especially to online teams and organizations. They had a background in systems engineering and systems thinking, I had a background in thinking about complex systems like the ants and also learning about active inference. And altogether, we knew that we had a lot of learning and applying ahead of us. And so we thought, how will we rise or meet this unknown unknown and only parts of it we were in a position to see at that moment? How will we meet this large challenge? of applying active inference, a framework which is still undergoing conceptual development, just like all conceptual frameworks are, but also one that we believe has a lot of possibilities for application. And so we thought we're not in a position to be hiring people to be in an academic lab, getting graduate students, and the pace on that would be slow, even if that were an affordance that we had, an opportunity for action. And so we wanted to take the spirit of open science, decentralized science, and just participatory sense making and bring some of these threads together by offering this co creative space, the Active Inference Lab, where participants from different backgrounds, different time zones, different levels of familiarity with active inference and other topics can come together and be learning, communicating, and applying active inference. That's uh, really nice to hear the background to that and the kind of the, the spirit of it being so open and uh, open to people joining in. And I would encourage anyone who's interested after they've heard what Active Insurance is to, to subscribe to your channel. And you always take time in the first of a series of digesting papers to kind of really slow things down and to um, cover all the, the different concepts that you're going to talk about in a, in a particular series. So let's start by just um, in a nutshell, can you explain what is active inference, please? Okay, well, the first thing that comes to mind with a question about nutshells 
is Hamlet, who said, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space. So mm. active inference is very austere in some ways, because the kernel of this nut, the action perception loop, is very pre-application, let's say. It's very general, and it needs a lot of meat to be added and more to that skeleton before there's something there to simulate or use even as a thinking tool. So the kernel of the nut is very simple, almost to the point of being infuriatingly so like language. So that would be my zeroth pass would be the nutshell is its own domain and inside of it, there's so much space to be developing and there's so much that will sprout out of it, but yes, good. Okay. So the infuriatingly simple um, bits about action and perception, what is that? So if there's someone you've never, never uh, spoken to before you meet them um, in an elevator, what would you say action uh, active inference is? Okay. So here's how, I would uh, perhaps approach that. It's all in the title. Active inference is about integrating action and inference. And then if we go one level deeper, we're using inference, which is to say like cognition or in a computer happens to be computation. We're using inference as a way of integrating our models and perspectives on action with cognitive processes that include planning, perception, emotion, memory, anticipation. So we have this tremendous diversity of sensory processes. Those could be our visual sense, our olfactory sense, our interoception, proprioception. So we have many inputs to the system. And then there's also a diversity of actions that different systems select. And those can be like the sort of onboard action opportunities, the onboard affordances for bodily action. And also they can include extended affordances like using a computer or using a pencil. So we have a lot of inputs and then we have a lot of outputs. So a lot of sense coming in, a lot of actions coming out. And then there's a lot of things that happen in between in what we call broadly cognition. Again, like some of those features or phenomena I mentioned, like planning, anticipation, memory, etc. Now, we could have bespoke, narrow theories for each sensory modality, for each cognitive phenomena, and for each action affordance. And or we might be interested in pursuing some integrative ways to unify our formal models and our informal models of perception, cognition, and action. So I believe that is what active inference offers. And then we can go into in a second how it differs from some other frameworks, but I believe what it offers is a way to think about that input space, the cognitive space, and the output space, as well as in the impact, which is kind of the fourth quadrant there, thinking about all of those in a unified way, which at the very least we have to do for useful computational modeling, but also just for useful sense making. Okay. Okay. So it really unifies all of the different components of our being you'd say of our how we experience ourselves is that going too far each will use the map to navigate the territory so if it's honest in how you say it then amazing i hope so and how, me, how does it okay. sorry i was just going to say how does it differ then from you know other more classical ways of viewing how living organisms go about their business of staying alive? Awesome question. I hope, or as we would say in ActInf, expect and prefer that in the future, there will be a URL that I can provide where these will be listed and enumerated and more referenced, but just off the cuff. How does active inference differ from other potentially integrative theories for action and perception and cognition, whether they be cybernetic or more system specific, like a human psychological theory. So 
one key difference between active inference and some frameworks for biological and computational behavior like reinforcement learning is that in active inference, action selection is accomplished by always the joint consideration of epistemic and pragmatic value. Epistemic value means the value of information or of learning and knowledge, like epistemology, and pragmatic value is like utility or reward. And so in reinforcement learning, there's an emphasis on the common currency of pragmatics, reward value. And then it leaves a bit of this awkward or ad hoc way that curiosity and intrinsic motivation has to re-enter and be translated or transmuted into this common currency of pragmatics, like a curiosity bonus, right? We'll pay you a little bit to go on an extra epistemic foraging trip. In active inference, though, we can have a common grounding between epistemic and pragmatic value, which enables our simulations and our embodied systems to rapidly make decisions that in one moment are more exploratory and in the next moment can be more exploitative over multiple timescales. So first point is it's a way that different than reinforcement learning, we can bring epistemic and pragmatic value into a common ground. The second is short, and that's as mentioned earlier, that in contrast with essentially any other framework, although I'm open to hearing what else people bring to the table, it integrates very diverse and heterogeneous perceptual, cognitive, and action features in at least an inter-accommodating framework. And so very few other theories or frameworks attempt to have such a scope. For example, there might be a model of just memory or of just action selection, but then those are like different modules that then have an ad hoc connection. And so active inference gives a principled set of connections. And then the last point that I'll make in terms of differentiation with active inference versus many other theories is with active inference, we can be quite explicit about where are we talking about the map and where are we talking about the territory? And so the territory, how things quote really are and the map, how we're modeling it. And so I think about a linear regression. And if we did a linear regression between height and weight, and we found that there was a positive or negative correlation or however it may be, nobody would think, well, you're saying that height and weight are a linear regression. Because the linear regression is just a map, it's just a model of a territory. And so similarly with active inference, though many times people are interested in how things quote really are, how the territory is, and may even use active inference to discuss as if they are discovering how the territory is, we also have this opportunity to be very clear about map making. And I think that is a tremendous value because it helps us hold a space between the observations that we're taking from a system and the modeling that we're doing while also leaving some of the mystery and openness. Okay, some of the mystery and openness. Um, the use of you know words terrain and map mate, mate, making there, I think, um, will be useful later on when we dive into some of the concepts uh, of that are used amongst your colleagues and peers <clears throat> in the lab, um, especially when it comes to this idea of you know um, sometimes it appears like the terrain and the map are identical uh, you know day to day as I go about my daily life I feel that what I you know things happen so quickly that it feels like um I'm actually that the terrain and the map equal each other but what I'm here is here saying here is that um active inference gives us an opportunity to understand how the map is formed and how it relates to the changing terrain. Is that right? Yes. So we're all, without falling into any simple fallacies, we're all inside of our sensorium. Mm -hmm. Pick a different spatial metaphor if you choose, but we are not directly observing lightning strikes in clouds. We're receiving sensory input in the form of sound and light, in that case of like lightning and thunder. 
and then we're doing inference on a hidden cause, an unobserved cause. Again, though we observe the sensory consequences of the territory, and we can take a totally action-oriented, realist, pragmatic, let's get out of this open field because there's a thunder and lightning storm happening so we can make useful action while also holding that space and not thinking, well, we won't be able to take useful action until we're in that cloud directly observing the lightning strike. It's like, mm -hmm. no, we are observing the light and the sound and we're making an inference about unobserved causes and we can share that with each other and we can decide how to act based upon that. And then maybe when we're hanging out in the house, we could talk about what is real and what lightning really might be. But there's also this ability to be applying active inference again at the level of mapping while also holding space for some philosophical questions about the nature of the territory. Okay, so um, I think this is getting to a really key point here. So the sensorium, um, way I understand it is that that's just that's a way of describing the the collection of different things we might sense. So it's our a bit like um, you know we have the genome and the microbiome or collections of genes and microbes, but the sensorium is our global collection of sensors. So not just the five sensors, as you said, um, the uh, interoception, proprioception, all of these things. Um, maybe pH, blood pressure, temperature. Uh, changes in air pressure outside of us is anything that we might sense either consciously or subconsciously. Is that yep. And if I could bring in one term from a field that active inference draws a lot on, which is ecological psychology. Um, ecological psychology provided that notion of affordance, which is like a capacity for action. So it's something that could be selected on the outbound. And then a sort of complement to the term affordance is umwelt. And yes, it's a German term or something like that. And I'm sure it could be looked up and searched more, but it is exactly referring to that sensorium, which is that integrated perceptual experience and inactive inference that is actually an actively generated process. And we can experience that directly with our visual input. So in the anatomy of the eye, there's actually color receptive cells that are more concentrated in the center of the eye. So there's higher resolution and there's color vision in the center of the eye. And that actually kind of drops off in color perception and in uh, clarity as it goes out. And of course, there's a quite large blind spot in the eye, which is like where the optic nerve is coming out. Yet our visual experience, or at least a possible visual experience has the felt sense of color in all parts of the visual field, equal clarity, and quite curiously, no blind spot, right? Mm -hmm. So even just in the visual modality, before we get to multisensory integration or some of these more ineffable senses, we're already quite aware that that umwelt, that sensorium, is not just a signal processing. It's not just the microphone and then the filter and then the central processing unit and then the action selection unit. There's actually something quite dynamic where even when we close our eyes, we can still continue to have a generative model. But when our eyes are open, that too is a generative model, one that is meeting a compromise with the incoming sensory information to be sure, but also is actively generated by the generative model of the organism. So, um, or uh, just to sort of quote, uh, I think it's Anil Seth from his book, Being You, He's, he says that all of our perceptions are controlled hallucinations that happen um, with, through, and because of, you know, our, our body. So um, this, so it's not just visualized things we visualize with our eyes closed that are kind of uh, models actually everything that we perceive is constructed as a kind of uh, to help a model to help us understand things which are beyond our direct ability to ability to um, to perceive directly yes i think we can 
even explore this notion of perception as active or generative in two senses. So the first is in this sense of the generative model, for example, of vision, where there's this um, generated visual scene, what Anil Seth calls the controlled hallucination, that is being met with a compromise by incoming sensory data. And that can be modeled using Bayesian techniques, but we won't go down that road. So that's one sense that perception is generative and active. Just to summarize is it's not this passive receiving, it's something endogenous, internal, and then being met with a compromise with internal uh, incoming information. And the other sense that perception is quite importantly active, it's an amazing example that's used in the recently introduced active inference textbook. And I think it also speaks to this map territory distinction and the importance of action for perception. And so the experiment, the embodied experiment goes like this, place one's finger on their pants. And so that is- I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna do this now. So on my thigh, just when you say pants okay. in English, sorry, in England means uh, underpants, but I can do it on anywhere on my trousers. <laughs> Now I have reinterpreted many of my previous awkward interactions. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> yes, on one's favorite piece of clothing or fabric, on the couch okay. if they may. Is the fabric rough? And the answer is actually to even determine that, the finger must be moved because the roughness is a, is a feature that we do active inference on through actual physical motion. And by reducing our uncertainty through action, we're integrating action and perception. And so we couldn't just sit there, so to speak, with our finger unmoving and think about whether it's rough or not. So here the fabric is like the territory and the map is how rough is it there? Maybe there's parts where it's rough and there's parts where it's smooth, but how could we know if all we have is a finger in a dark room we need to move it. And that actually has a lot to do with other cases of active perception, like ocular motor movement, eye motion when we're reading or scanning, or all other kinds of things that people can think of where the sensory inputs are not predestined or determined, but they're actively sought after in a way that is more like seeking and informed foraging rather than just ad hoc sampling. Mm, mm. That's a really simple but powerful example. So I can't tell if something's rough or smooth. Um, I could guess it if I was looking at it, but by touch, I have to move. I have to take this active part of the to infer whether it's rough or smooth. And uh, so that's a kind of an easy to grasp physical example because um we all know how to move our fingers and feel texture um but what we're saying is that that principle applies to all types of inference um yeah it's act there's an active component and i guess that makes sense with sound because we can only you know it's the moving between pictures isn't it it's the change that allows us to interpret sound if it was all con just one tone and constant we would never be able to distinguish between anything audible and and, and just one other example so we've mentioned the physical palpation with touch and touch receptors and so it's a yes and with all the biology of the touch receptors so this is something that is here to again, be a yes and to all the molecular biology of touch. It's just adding in this note that in the organismal context, action is part of the perceptive process. Then we mentioned the visual scanning. And then a third example might be in communication where somebody might have uncertainty about whether their conversant is on the same page as them or seeing what they're seeing or whether they're grasping or comprehending. So it's like we already have these visual and tactile and even prehensile or grasping metaphors for communication and cognition. And we might take an active step of like asking, how does that sound to you? Or what does that make you think about? Or does that make sense what we're planning here? Those are an example of communication 
as action and inference in the interpersonal. And that's an example about how active inference can be applied at the cellular and at the organismal level, but also at the interpersonal level, which again speaks to one of the important aspects of this integrative framework, which is that it helps us connect the dots with different systems and scales. And um, that helps me appreciate the, the, the concept of an affordance as well, which you, you mentioned. So um, you can't really, you know, so an affordance from what I understand is that the, the quality of something. So, you know, a cup um, has got graspability. I can hold it, but to, um, you know, to a fork laying on the table that the, the, the cup isn't graspable because the fork isn't, doesn't ever use cups. So it's the, act, the fact that we have to actively do something that makes the cup have the affordance of being graspable. Um, and, and an important piece there is that relationality or the way that you described how the affordance, it's not like we could just tag the cup as being grabbable by whom? Not even by all humans. And so actually the concept of an affordance and this radically relational nature of affordances and situational helps us bring accessibility into the picture, bring personalization and just other situational context, because there's no such thing as an affordance that is agnostic to the actor. And so, again, it's an example of a qualitative insight, like interactions are relational or preferences, expectations, affordances, all are conditional on the situation. Those are quite qualitative felt senses that many people may resonate with. They might not have on their own connected that to Bayesian statistics and formal models of the action perception loop. However, we're all increasingly finding that indeed those connections are there and hopefully we can hold the space for there to be a continuum of discussion again, between those qualitative insights like context matters and some formal models for action and perception in context. Okay. Um, can we uh, think about, I'm looking at your mission statements again for the Active Inference Lab. So it's um, a participatory online lab that's communicating, learning and practicing applied ac active inference can um we think about the practicing applied part so um in what ways can active inference be applied once you become aware of the concept how can you apply it or practice it awesome well i look forward to a thousand applications blooming so i have more uncertainty than certainty on that question because I think we're just beginning. A few areas where active inference has been applied, if I could list them and then we can see which ones might be interesting. The first is in the area of bodily physiology, whether in interoception as well as in mental health and in um, cognitive dynamics. So there's a lot of work that's been done in a clinical and in a psychological domain. A second area is in the group level. So thinking about online teams and communities as we and others have and modeling group communication as a case of active inference. And then the third might be in robotics and embodied non-biological systems or systems that we want to imbue with some natural perceptive, cognitive and active features, but are not the same type of biological thing as we are. So those would be three quite interesting areas would be the organismal and bodily, the community team group communication space, and the embodied robotics. I find that the, so uh, the second one, the hardest to, to kind of see how that would be applied. I can see how, you know, in, as you said, mental health and, um, uh, uh, yeah, in the health domain, it, it's it's really easy to apply or possible to apply, and also robotics or artificial intelligence because you know it's all very much about being able to 
take action and infer and all of that. But for the the group dynamics, um, how can you give a sort of example about how the concept of active inference applies in a group setting? I'm thinking about your ants in the field now. Yes, yes. Is the ant the nestmate or is the ant the colony? Well, aren't colonies just sets of nestmates? But aren't nestmates just sets of organs? And aren't organs just mm. sets of cells and so on? And mm. how do we think about collective action? Mm -hmm. And again, somebody may have no issue with thinking about an organism as being the locus of perception, cognition, and action. People make decisions, right? Yet groups also make decisions, sometimes explicitly, like through what is quite literally called policy decision-making in governance or in an organization. We also call that policy selection in active inference. So sometimes groups make overt policy selection, and there's some type of internal process of determining that, like a vote or however it's done. So just as we could think about the subunits, whether they're modeled or unmodeled in the organism, leading to an organismal decision about policy, we could also think about an analogous process, be it implicitly or explicitly reached for how groups are making decisions. And then that is that interesting question where, well, I mean, Again, groups don't have perceptions, cognitions, and actions. They're just composed of people who do. Okay, fine. But then people don't, right? It's just the cells. And that's the um, reductionist slippery slope. And then one can also um, take the train in the other direction, the holist slippery slope. Well, individuals, be they cells or organisms or groups, they're always in an ecological context. And so they actually can only be said to be a bit player in their decision making because they're part of these extended enacted networks of action and so it's like we know there's a train that slides us down the reductionist path and we know there's a train that slides us down the holism path and so much work beyond active inference has observed that relationship or tension or dialectic and again active inference is like maybe in that metaphor like the train conductor helping us do something useful and move things back and forth and have fun and hang out on the train while we're in a qualified way and hopefully in a principled and rigorous and accessible way modeling these different scales of the system yeah the uh policy and politics and group decision making that that makes sense now it's reminded me of a conversation i had with um uh, prof professor of politics called Laura Cram from Edinburgh University. So her day job is to um, is academic and to look at uh, uh, politics and decision decision making within politics. But um, mm -hmm. outside of that, she teaches. She's a yoga teacher and um, has created a uh, a type of yoga called interception yoga, or that's what she brands it as. Um, and she cited a very interesting study where. It was looking at um, decision making in politics, and you know, um, as the person, as a person enters a room into a meeting, uh, depending on what the what flags are placed in front of them that they see from different countries, will influence the decisions mm. they make in the meeting. So, you know, it's mm. uh, the this idea of the symbolism of what's presented in front of us, influencing the actions we take, the decisions or the actions we take. And that's just from a flag, you know? And um, so fascinating stuff, mind boggling stuff. That makes me think about polling or polling when there's an assessment of sentiment, for example, within an organization or within a country that is kind of like interoception at that group level. Mm -hmm. There's the, the palpation, that's like the customs are on the border, on the interface. And then there's the interoception, which is like the sensing within. And so as I've listened to your work and seen this area of interoception develop, it reminds me of sometimes that external focus that 
perception, cognition, and action have had. And now I think we're seeing new ways of balancing, not prioritizing or ranking. They're just different complementary processes of extero and interoception. And wouldn't it would be awesome to have unifying ways of talking about them and modeling them so this didn't have to be like this topping of food versus this topping or like <laughs> sports teams. There are not team exteroception and team interoception. There's the organismal mystery and the territory. And then there's how we model it. Our mapping and sense-making process, which is participatory and collaborative and built on the shoulders of giants and so on. And so to be able to, again, respect but also have usefulness in that space brings us back to active inferences focus on both the epistemic and the pragmatic value and how in moment to moment those shift you're doing something useful and then all of a sudden you need to go do an action that's useful because it helps you reveal something an epistemic action and so just again having fluidity to talk about those two sides of the interoception, exteroception coin, and the two sides of the coin with epistemic and pragmatic, two sides of the coin with perception and action. It's kind of this minimum of two idea that pervades a lot of the discussion that gives us flexibility, but also the ability to like drill in and do useful things. It's 19. Mm. Uh, do you, Daniel, do you have any personal experiences or examples to share of how uh, viewing the world through the lens of active inference has influenced your own life, changed your behavior or um, allowed you to see things differently or situations differently than you did before, if you can remember life before active inference. <laughs> when I was a young forager. <laughs> well, there's probably many expressible and ineffable ways to address that. And I think of it as a show not tell, but the example that comes to mind is again, related to my ant research as I was just beginning to study this area. So on one hand, I was reading and learning, not doing anything useful from the point of view of perhaps some, but I was learning because I was continually being surrounded by novelty and new information and what was very exciting and just meeting my curiosity with this endless stream of papers and formalisms. And then on the other hand, I was there in the field with the stopwatch and the ants. And so I thought, how can there be a synthesis of the ways that the ant research community has modeled the multi-scale system that are the ants and this kind of abstract notions that I'm learning in active inference and I acted. I reached out to authors and I started sketching different models and that moved onto a path that resulted, for example, in 2021 in an active infer ant model. And so that was something where it wasn't on my radar when I started that process of action and curiosity in tandem. And so I think that active inference through bigger, longer time scale phenomena, like just described, like adjusting one's research agenda or regime of attention, as we might say, towards applying active inference to a phenomena that I was already interested in, but then seeing how that plays at a much shorter time scale too. It's just fun to weave together the concepts and find the patterns across different systems and phenomena. Yeah, I got a sense of the the looping there. So you went from um, curiosity to action, reaching out to people, and that's uh, that loop has kind of snowballed, I suppose, and brought you where you are today. Wonderful. So I first became of aware of the term active inference after reading it in a, a paper by Seth and Friston on um, the topic which this channel is all about which is interoception and the paper was called active interoceptive inference so they they jammed mm. interoceptive in between uh, active and inference and the emotional brain and it um so it speaks to the heart of the inner sense channel and 
the way I understand it is that um, what we what we can see is a model where signals from our body, so these feelings that we um, sense from inside our body, can be used to update our predictions about the state of the body. So you know, I'm now hungry because my stomach's rumbling, for example, or uh, um, and we could just leave it there, or we could actually lead to an action that helps us return to, helps us keep, stay alive, basically, um, return to homeostasis. So this is, you know, my um, uh, blood vessels dilate or contract, and that helps me move towards food, for example. So we uh, carry on. If I, if I could give it on the temperature example, and how active inference deals with homeostasis, that return to a normal temperature range or pH or blood sugar range, but also how active inference deals with allostasis, which is sometimes where stress is actively pursued by an organism, or they make a decision that's anticipatory, like choosing to bring a jacket with the expectation that it will be colder outside. So in those kinds of settings, which we interpret as cognitive, like if a robot or an ant did it, we would think that it was thinking because it planned to bring the jacket along. And so that's like allostasis or planning because it's the expectation through time of body temperature and actions can be taken in anticipation about future expectations. Somebody can wince before there's a physical impact and there's probably so many other Example. So just wanted to add that point that a lot of frameworks deal with homeostasis and the return to like a control region. And that's very familiar to the areas of like cybernetics and control theory. But where are those frameworks without this deep generative model concept sometimes fall a little short is in dealing with situations where there's uncertainty about the future, but actions are taken now to ameliorate that uncertainty about the future or to bring body temperature into alignment again in the future, but not putting on the jacket in the house, but mm. preparing a future affordance. So just wanted to bring that up because mm. that temperature example, it's both a basic example used in cybernetics and control theory and homeostasis and physiology, but just by moving into that example, again, qualitatively, before we layer on any math or any variables, we can think about the reality of how temperature is modulated in the world. And that opens up a very rich discussion about other cognitive features that would be really important to consider. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, the term allostasis um, is uh, less well known than homeostasis. And um, it's, as, you're, as you're saying that, so, you know, um, Lisa Feldman Barrett has come up with the term body budgeting, which, as I understand it, is equivalent to allostasis. And it, so it's got that kind of idea of budgeting or forecasting, as you say, planning into the future. And the body bit is about that it's looking after our, you know, our energy or resource budget or balance. Um, so the, and as, you're, as you use that example of temperature and putting on a jumper, uh, I was thinking, OK, that's that's for me personally. And then I might build a house to control my temperature environment for my family. And then we have weather broadcasters and weather stations, which for you going back to your point about group um, decision making, you know, if uh, the weatherman or woman says tomorrow there's going to be a snowstorm, then that changes the decision that has an act, people will take action on a kind of city or country or nation wide scale. So um, would you say that's allostatic control at a group level or active inference at a national level? Absolutely. The weather person provides a high and a low temperature, let's just say. But another way that they could share those two temperatures would be like the midpoint and then the variance around that midpoint. And so that's still sharing two numbers. So instead of saying it's going to be between 20 and 30, we could say it's going to be like 25, plausibly plus or minus five. And it still could be outside with a smaller probability, but 95% or 99% of the time. So absolutely what they're conveying is their estimate and uncertainty, which is kind of like where epistemic humility comes into play 
we say things like, I'm not sure about, or I'm quite sure about. Mm -hmm. And again, that's reflected in that weather report. Is it 28 to 32 or is it 10 to 40? So what is the variance? And we always hold space for that mean estimate and the variance estimate. And yes, the weather report is being utilized as an actionable signal for people who then take actions from their set of affordances based upon the information they're receiving. So then people go and buy a jacket if they hear that there's going to be an upcoming string of cold days, for example. And so, yes, it's a great example about how communication at the group level is happening through information technology and through meteorology. But then also there's that biological version of like different cells and different organs, mm -hmm. kind of like sending weather reports. And um, mm -hmm. there was a professor at my graduate school, Craig Heller, who made this awesome and interesting technology. It was like a glove and there was other variants that had a slight negative pressure. And then it had cool, but not cold water circulating. And it turned out that that was able to reduce the body's temperature and that previously many um, approaches that people had taken to recovering people from hypothermic or hyperthermic entailed putting cold or hot appropriately on like their thermal sensors. And that actually sometimes suppressed the body's actual thermal response because it's like the body's overheated and the danger is the core overheating. But then the thermo sensors, like on the shoulders, would become cooled down. So the person would immediately feel relief, mm -hmm. but it mm -hmm. shut down their endogenous vasodilation and actual heat dissipation, which created mm -hmm. a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. And so this is like a way of not using active inference, but of course could be modeled as such and working with the ways that bodily and group systems actually do communicate and make decisions rather than thinking that we can just intervene in this one specific way. I love that example. And um, it sort of reminds me of some of the therapeutic approaches for dealing with something like anxiety or phobias, where mm. you're wanting to, you know, stop the overall system from um, going about its, you know, its normal action perception loop and find an entry point and give it a different way to update its its model or update its action um, so that it doesn't turn into a vicious cycle. Um, and, you know, the, that that method, I suppose, which they had a, a negative pleasure glove or something you said, I guess that's similar to the, some of these techniques like, um, you know, the Wim Hof method or something where the, the person is training themselves so that their body doesn't... Um, I guess you could say it's the, the set points, the uh, allostatic set points are being shifted by the practice or the, the model of how dangerous the world is, is being changed um, by the practice. So the, the perception of threat is being altered. Yes. Entities are taking actions that are aligned with a kind of entity they expect and prefer themselves to be. And that's something that, for sure can be unpacked and explored, but perhaps methods of training, like the breathing methods that you mentioned, in the sense they update, I'm the kind of thing that is chill in a cold shower. That's me. I'm that person who does take a cold shower, who has the discipline to do so, and who sees that being enacted, not the kind of entity who observes the book being unread on the table about cold showers, but doesn't feel the cold. I'm the person who is now perceiving, taking deep breaths and all that comes along with that from the vagus, et cetera, while I'm also getting that cold water. And that is where the updating and the development happens, not in the hypothesized experience. So I think there's some amazing and deep and relatively lesser explored territory with how we frame our own interoception and development. Mm -hmm. and, um, I mean, we, I'm tempted to sort of go deep in this on the and go into the free energy principle and um, uh, expecting ourselves to be in a state. And but I'll save that maybe for another time. Um, I am aware we're coming up to an hour, and this was um, due to be an hour hour long meeting. 
Um, do you? Uh, I wanted to go into some of the terms um, that you use with your your colleagues, uh, but I think we'll maybe we'll leave that. Um, can you... if, if I could give a, a closing note there, just yes. on, a, on a historical and a mm. relatively closing issue, then we can however much shortly longer you'd like. Several years ago, and in earlier developmental stages of this framework, there was, I would say, less clarity between what the free energy principle was and active inference. And so I hope that increasingly it becomes distinguished and that people can find accessible on ramps onto both. But for those who are listening this far in, yes, it would be awesome to unpack it in the future, but active inference is about that action perception loop and free energy sort of meets there and goes in a totally different direction. Okay. Well, I don't know if it's totally different, but it is a different approach. And so like, it is a different way that we can go. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, if anyone watching or listening to this is curious about the free energy principle, then there's lots to be enjoyed on that topic. Um, one, one question before we wind up. Do you have any thoughts about when uh, interoceptive active inference could become maladaptive to an organism? As I am only... An ant doctor, I can only speak to that, but it makes me think about anteroception. And I think, well, how could it become maladaptive in the colony if its internal perception, for example, of how much food it has becomes maladaptive? What if it's continuing to forage and just store up seeds way beyond what's reasonable? What if there aren't enough seeds, but it isn't foraging because it's not elicited to do so? because it's colony level interoception isn't happening? Or what if it's blocking up its entryway every time it gets cloudy, and that's actually like a false positive rate that's unacceptable, but it would be appropriate to act that way sometimes when it does flood in the desert, but it's not that way every day. And so I think it's a very interesting and important area to understand how different contexts and different people and different cognitive systems find themselves in situations where the ball rolls downhill and it all makes sense, yet it goes in a way that we don't prefer. And so again, it both does make sense why the body and mind and spirit are compensating in a given way, but also we may want to be part of that process and move it to a different space. Yeah. They've, those two examples are really, you know, nice examples. I, uh, about gathering resources like food, you know, do I need to keep hoarding, 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 hoarding or not? Or no, it's fine to let the cupboards go, go empty. We'll be fine. Everything's okay. And the weather one, you know, the, oh, it's a little bit cloudy, batten down the hatches for the next month, uh, but nothing actually happened. Or the other, other extreme, nah, don't believe the weatherman. And then. I'm sure then, there's analogies at the organismal and at the social level. Well, thank you so much for your time and I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, where can people, well, what's on the horizon for the Active Inference Lab over the next few weeks and where can people find out more about your work? Awesome. Yes, thanks again. And I look forward to continuing the interaction in different ways. So to learn more about Active Lab, head over to activeinference.org and you'll find a lot of resources there you can also find our videos and other content and so on, as well as find out about your affordances for participating in the lab. So that's definitely the best way to find out more. Some of our next steps, just to name a few, include discussions with none other than you, where we'll be with some other authors of work on osteopathy and the Therapeutic Alliance and a lot of other fascinating topics. And we continue to develop some educational materials as well as work through the textbook. There's a lot of learning and applying that people are involved in in Active Lab. Great, exciting times. And awesome, that yeah, really fun times. I'm, again, I'm looking forward to continuing it and one hour is not enough, but one year is not enough. So onwards we forage. 
Onwards we forage. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you. See you later. Bye.